Okay. I will make a short con uh, introduction. All right. This is the uh, 21st MR seminar, and uh, we are going to listen to Dr. Tim Pringle from Suas University of London. He is going to talk to us about trade unions of former common economies. Uh, that is uh, Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union countries, but mainly Eastern Europe, Russia, China and Vietnam is going to talk to us. He is a senior lecturer in labor, social movements and development at SUAZ and the editor of China Quarterly and he has recently been to China one week ago. He has some fresh knowledge about these countries. Uh, I hope everybody will enjoy it. Uh, after the uh, talk, we are going to discuss, uh, we are going to steal some uh, questions and he is going to answer us. Thank you. Please. Okay, well, okay, thank you, Ismail. So first of all, I'd like to, to thank you guys very much for uh, in, inviting me to, to come and talk here. Um, I'm sure I will have as much to learn from you guys as, as anything you may pick up from, from, from myself. Tonight, uh, um, I, I thought a, a lot about this talk, and I thought rather than, obviously I will make references to, to Eastern European countries, but I'm going to focus uh, on Vietnam and make uh, in the slide, but I will also talk in, in some detail about China and uh, a little less detail about Russia. So, uh, and then try and draw some, com some comparisons there. Um, this, these topics don't cover the whole book. I'll come to the book in a minute. What, what, what we have here is really, and this book is freely available. It's not behind some academic firewall. Um, I'll send, I think if I haven't sent Ismail the link already, I will send, send it to him. Uh, it's uh, available. It's, a, it's a, a project by the Social Democratic Foundation uh, group in, in Germany. Uh, it has some of the faults that you would associate with that or some of the challenges you associate with that. Uh, it brings together different approaches. Okay? So that, that's the book. You can get it either there, that's the link. I will send this to Ishmael so he can forward it. Or you can do a search for trade unions in transition from command to market economies, or email me, that might be the easiest as well, email me and I'll send you the link at TP21 there. It's, it's a free book, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a civil, it's, uh, no, no, it's not, it's not, a, it, although it's written largely by academics, um, uh, there are academic activists in there as well, and I include myself, most of the comrades from China who contributed are, are, are activists, um, and from some of the other countries as well. Okay, so it's a co-authored volume. Um, uh, obviously I didn't write and nor did my co-co-author, uh, uh, co co sorry, not co-edited co volume, there's a mistake there. Um, we brought together, uh, back in St. Petersburg in 2015, uh, 16 authors from 10 countries. As I said, these were mainly academics, but there were practitioners, i.e. trade unionists, and also activists as well. Um, uh, the, shall I wait for... Yeah, I carry on slowly, yeah. Um, the, uh, I have to acknowledge my co-editor, Rudy Trobmetz, who is an employee of the FBS Foundation, or Frederick Eber Uh This is his brainchild. Uh, so everything, uh, uh, and uh, he's been working with FBS for 30 years. He's an expert in trade union, or an expert in trade union uh, matters pretty much around the world. Yeah. Uh, as I said, we started off in St. Petersburg in 2015. It's been a long project in the making. Uh, getting 16 authors from 10 countries together, uh, none of whom, apart from myself, were writing in their mother tongue. Uh, it was, it was, it's been a real challenge, and I'd like to acknowledge the con huge contribution of Rudy for keeping it going over this, these three long, long, long years as well. Interestingly uh, uh, as well, certainly in the countries that I'm going to talk about today, mainly the uh, former uh, China, Russia and Vietnam, um, 
the, uh, the situation for activists, the situation for research around labor relations, labor movements, has become much, much more difficult um, since then. The pressure was beginning to build up before 2015, but um, uh, you know, you don't need to be an academic or an activist to know that, just a simple look at the paper. So maybe not so much in China and Russia, that is, that is less hidden. Um, why, so why did we pick on, you know, to look at this notion, we're, we're talking about, um, you can see it in the title, transition. The main theme is, is transition, really. And why did we pick trade unions? Why did we pick labor relations? Why are we looking at it through that lens? Well, you guys will know probably as well, if not better than me, that most major societal transformations involve changes to social, social relations. Uh, that produce the value in society, be it agricultural to industrialization, or in the modern era, uh, and, and in the modern era, labor relations have become a core, absolutely core social re relation. Uh, in what I loosely term post, I don't really like the term post-industrial society, but societies moving away from industrialized states such as, such as the UK, for example, in, in service, increasing service or financialized financialized economies, um, we've seen uh, how the impact of, of labor relations with the, on, on labor relations on, on that transition. And equally important, I think, and I think it is a, a transition, despite the fact that both Vietnam and China nominally remain worker states in the broader sense of the word constitutionally, and, and that's how they politically pre present themselves, these, I would argue that these are in fact post-socialist countries where um, they are not, I wouldn't argue that they are neoliberal countries, um, uh, but they are certainly uh, dominated by capitalist labor relations. Um, but of course, these transformations, or I, I'm using the word transformation and transition in inter, inter, what's the word, inter, whatever, I could, thank you, it's a it. Um, I know there are slightly different different meanings. We maybe discuss that, but um, th these 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 transformations unfold at different scales and at different speeds. So, if you look at socialism, so what I've called, what is often called in the literature, post-socialism, um, um, the uh, you know, what happened in Russia is a totally different story to what happened in China. Um, uh, the the, uh, the what I would call the, the tragedy that followed. Uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, the, the, the 1990s, that devastating effect on the Russian working class. Um, I remember uh, that there was the outcome of, of the Chicago experiment being foisted on, on, on Moscow and, and on, on Russia. I remember interviewing, uh, through a translator, a policeman in Russia back, back, in, 90, back in 2006, two, a bit earlier, 2003, and, um, not interviewing, just talking, really, and um, he said that one of the first jobs that he had to do in the 90s was go around and pick up those people who had frozen to death on the streets in the winter. So this was a, this was a, a real tragedy that descended on the, the Russian working class. In China, we had this uh, this, this different, uh, different rate or different scale and speed of, uh, of a transition to post-socialism. Whereby Chinese governance is often based around pilot areas, and indeed, if you look at the notion of a special economic zone, which pioneered this transformation, this economic transformation, at least in in, in China, um, zones are very much hived off. They're separate from, uh, or SEZs or export processing zones, are hived off from national labour law and regulations. They often have separate trade union laws and regulations. They're seen very much as were well, China very much seen as a, a social laboratory, really, before, whether they work or not in terms of, um, in, 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 in terms here, of, of producing uh, surplus value, whether they're rolled off, rolled off across the country, rolled out across the country. But the rate in China, it wasn't a big Chicago-style bank. It was very much a, a gradual affair uh, that took, that went in jumps and starts, more so, I think, in China than in Vietnam. Vietnam uh, was also at a much slower pace than Russia, but but it was um, uh, but in, in in China it was very much a jump and start. And I think there is an argument. I'm not going to make it here because we don't have time to go into that much detail. But I think that there is an argument to make to to chart that 
that process really, not just in Chinese governance, but in the process of class struggle in China as well at the time. Um, you can, maybe that can come up in, in questions as well. And, and indeed, when we think of China now, we often think of southern China, of Guangdong province, uh, which is now, I think, the, the G, gross, gross domestic product, uh, uh, gro, gro, G, GDP of Guangdong is, um, let me get this right, is is larger than Rus the Russian GDP. I'm, I'm 85 to 90 percent sure of my facts on that. So um, I'm sure we'll get we'll get come back on the on the video if I'm wrong. But it is a hugely um, you know, it's, it's not for nothing that this province is called uh, it's been called the workshop, the new workshop of the world. But that province itself, having having been subject to Chinese economic reforms, gradual. Um, in the 1980s and 90s, is now going through a process of industrial upgrading. There's a really good book by uh, a comrade called Florian Patolo on this, uh, which I would recommend going to try to understand both China's, Guangdong's recent history, but also um, its attempts to industrial up upgrade, to leave behind that kind of low grade, low skill export promotion model and move into a much more um, high-tech economy. It's a very interesting process. Can you say the name of that? Uh, uh, Butolo. Florian Butolo. B-U-T-O-L-L-O. -L -L -O. Well worth the read, I think. Okay. Yeah, Florian. I think Florian, what Florian does, he, he tells a lie that you get in, in my world, really, or in some of my research world, which is to really understand uh, to, you know, to, to do proper research in, in any given country, to understand any given country, you have to be entirely fluent in the language. Um, I think that is a, essentially an elitist prospect. If you work with good interpreters, if you know your research plan, or, you know, then uh, you, you can produce brilliant work with, 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 with good, good, good stuff. So, uh, with, with good interpreters as well. In these transformations, you know, at different speeds and at different scales, we'll go into Vietnam in more detail uh, uh, later on. Uh, Labour has not been passive. Um, there is, particularly around Vietnam and China, there is this kind of stereotypical view of the Asian worker being prepared to work for very low wages. It has its roots, I think, in Orientalism, but also in, in the experience of Chinese migrants to the US as well, and the, the racism that they were subject to, and that, that, I, that idea that you, know, that you could treat Chinese or Asian labor as badly as you want because they were so desperate for money. That, that is a travesty, of, that is a misrepresentation both of the his, history of the Vietnamese and, and, and Chinese working classes, uh, despite the fact that it's racist as well, but also is, is belied by events. And, and in fact, as Beverly Silver has referred to in her book, um, The Forces of Labor, uh, uh, which is an, a historical adventure or historical exploration of the link between processes of democratization uh, and trade union activity and industrialization through through the study of, of capital, capitalism moving around the world. The forces of labor have been, I going to argue, a key driver in modern transformations in these post-socialist states, including Russia, although it's less obvious in Russia and, and the big kind of elephant in the room here, I think, not well, in this room because we're going to talk about it, but often uh, around the literature and particularly around uh, what I would call refer to as bourgeois commentaries on post-socialist countries, is is that um, Russian workers for better, won the right to organise. There, there is freedom of association in Russia. It's limited by recent recent revisions to the Labour Code and also recent revisions or revisions to the trade union law in, in, in Russia and we'll come back to that later. But nevertheless there is the right to organise in Russia. You can organise a trade union in Russia. If you or an independent or autonomous as they call it trade union in Russia. In in Vietnam and China, in China it is completely off the agenda. You cannot do this. If you do organise outside the All China Federation of Trade Unions you will spend at least four years in prison, at least, depending on how effective that, that organisation becomes. In Viet Vietnam is a really interesting case, um, because uh, uh, although Vietnamese workers have the right to strike, written in the, in the Vietnamese Labour Code, uh, I forget which, code, which, which clause it is, um, they don't have the right, if you organise, you have to be part of the Vietnamese Conf General Confederation of Labour, the VGCL. <coughs> 
Now, the re I don't know if you're aware, or you will be aware, that the recent, uh, until recently, there was quite, until Trump was elected, there was quite a lot of excitement in Vietnam, ironically, around the trade deal, TPP, that was going to be rolled out. Why was there so much excitement in Vietnam? Because trade deal, uh, in labor circles, even among activists as well, trade deals are, free trade deals are generally treated with resistance and, 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 and opposition among labor circles, and, and rightly so, I would argue. But in Vietnam, it was slightly different this time, because part of the deal, or the bilateral deal that formed part of TPP between Vietnam and the US, and there was a whole political economy going back to the war behind this, um, which we won't go into, but we'll maybe discuss uh, later, is that the, uh, the, the part of the deal was that Vietnam would allow independent or autonomous trade unions to organize. Now that was a potentially huge shift. So you actually had, among this party-led union, the VGCL, and among labor activists or worker activists, uh, a lot of discussion around this. The VGCL looked like they were preparing for competition from other trade union organizations if TPP went ahead, whereas uh, autonomous worker activists, uh, uh, NGOs, both trade union federations uh, outside Vietnam, were thinking very carefully about how to take advantage of this. So it was quite, you know, there you have a, a you know, the, the, the epitome of capitalist, ex, global capitalist exploitation, the free trade deal, providing on the face of it an opportunity for working class militants in Vietnam to organize at workplace level. There's a really good blog written on this by my PhD candidate, Joe, Joseph Buckley, uh, which I can send to you, it's, it's really well, where he kind of puts this, 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 this contradiction, if you like, in, into some kind of p perspective uh, from a political economy standpoint. Now, it's all history now because Trump cancelled the TPP, but I think the mere fact that it created so many waves gives us an indication of some of the differences between uh, of these different scales and speeds and some of the different politics around, say, China, Vietnam and Russia. Okay, so labor relations, they're central, they're important, they are a key social relation, they're at the core of the exploitation, uh, extraction of surplus value. So why look at trade unions, particularly trade unions in former or, or post-socialist societies? These trade unions uh, are, are hardly modicans of militant don't have a particularly militant history, certainly not, not recently anyway. Well, uh, you know, the first thing is that labour is about workers and the working class. Class, I think most people in this room, is a key dynamic of social change, of revolutionary change. Out there. So it's important to look at organisations in post-social states of, uh, uh, that, that working class people join or think about, or indeed don't think about, don't join and don't want to have anything to do with. Um, I, I think too we looked at trade unions because there are many different political perspectives in this book, in this volume. Um, each, each, uh, we'll come back to that later. So, but I think there was a collective agreement or an agreement among us all that the collective behaviours of trade unions, uh, they, they do have the impact to make a huge change. So let's take in Russia, um, the, the former, what I would call a state socialist trade union, uh, had 70 million members. It's now down to 20 million members. It lost a huge amount of uh, members in, in, in that wave of massive Chicago privatization. Um, nevertheless, a trade union says essentially, or it's generally, it's a, it's a non-governmental organization, give or take, in, certainly in a, in, a, in, a, in a capitalist, liberal democracy, so to speak. Um, uh, it, it is still the largest NGO or largest uh, membership-based organization in, in Russia. It's hugely important, even, and I'm going to argue, even now that it's muted, that it's, uh, that it's, that it's, that it's subject to uh, significant constraints, it is nevertheless potentially important. In Vietnam, the, the, the VGCL had, uh, unlike Russia and China, the VGCL uh, actually led the, uh, the foundation of the, came before the foundation of the, the Communist uh, Party, the CPD Communist Party of Vietnam, and, and, and the relationship between the VGCL, the Union, and the Communist Party is, is quite different from that that exists in China. In China, it is absolutely the party in control. 
the union pays second fiddle. He's a servant of the union of the party. In, in Vietnam, and I'll put some evidence on this later, it's a little bit different. There is more, there is more, more debate and more uh, tension between the two organisations. Mm. And, and, and then the, the, the other thing to note is why, why trade unions, well, if trade unions remain important, even in their often elitized form, even in, in you know, globally where we've seen a decline in union density, a decline in collective bargaining agreements, unions have been, you know, the substitution of, of, of traditional union forms of struggle with ILO, ILO notions of decent work, um, which is not to say decent work isn't a, good, isn't a good thing, of course it is, but the way to achieve it is the key, key thing there. And I would argue the, the ILO does face challenges through its own tripartite structure there. But um, uh, if we accept that they're important, we also need to look at the process of transformation, but also at the end of this book, there's a really interesting and, 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 and hard-hitting chapter uh, by uh, Frank Hoffer, who has worked in, uh, with trade unions in, in Soviet Union, former Soviet times, uh, but also been around ILO for a long, long time. And coming from an ILO perspective, but nevertheless, his, 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 his analysis, I think, does provide some insight into the future of, of, of trade union development in, in, in post-socialist countries and, and beyond as well. So to sum up, really, why we did this, why we use labor relations, why we looked at uh, um, trade union transition, is um, we wanted to understand the ways that trade unions adapt from the political, institutional, like all securities of the command, where, where trade unions had, great music, where trade unions had, um, uh, had faced no competition from other members. You know, there was only one union to join. Uh, uh, what it did, we'll come into later. And to, to the opposing interests that are imminent or at the heart of capitalist labor relations. So that transition, and so it, it's two totally different traditions, really. And, 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 I, and I think that, that too, is, is very important, how unions do that. So what do I mean? by trade union and norms. And I'm talking here really, and I know there are lots of different trade union types of trade unions in, in, in both East and West. So, but I'm, you know, if we look at the mainstream, it's definitely what, what Frida Wenton calls uh, from the ARC, productivist trade unions. Unions that essentially are not there, mainstream unions, if you like, they're not there to challenge capitalism. They're there to induce a uh, planian, uh, expression or manifestation of welfare capitalism at, at, at best. Now, of course, that's, you know, are they syndicalists, the Wobblies, are they anarcho-syndicalists, uh, revolution unions, Rosa Luxemburg, they, they're, all, they're all different interpretations of, of what a union is, but I'm here, so mainstream productive union norms are really based around, you guys are this as well as me, uh, the fundamental rights and principles from, from uh, developed by the, uh, not the ILO, I'm wrong there, uh, by the Former by the International Trade Union uh, Confederation, really, and these these are the eight of them. I won't we'll go into them now. They're fairly obvious. To, for the book, the two most important ones are the top two: freedom of association and protection of the right to organise and the convention uh, uh, around collective bargaining. Why are they the most important? Um, well, I think precisely because these norms. Uh, these mainstream norms represent almost the precise opposite of what unions in the command economy were there to do, really. So, um, if we accept that capitalist labor relations have, a, have opposing class interests, if we accept, more or less, that the way to blunt some of these interests of the employing classes is through collective bargaining. I, I know that is a contested idea, and certainly around the right to organise independent working class organisations. Um, then, then these unions are suddenly faced with challenges like this, like how to bargain with an employer. So bargaining with a state-owned enterprise leader, uh, director, should I say, in pre doi Moi in Vietnam, I before 1986, there would have been some kind of negotiation over the allocation of resources from the centre to the state-owned enterprise. Same goes in China, same with the collectives in Russia. But it wasn't about bargaining. It was seen it was on the basis of integrated interests of the collective uh, in, 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 in capitalist societies. That is obviously not the case. So 
we know, we know everybody knows what the norms that, that, that are around, uh, around uh, uh, productivist mainstream trade unions, and indeed anarchist, and, and more, more revolutionary unions as well. Um, uh, what, what were the norms of the command economy unions? Well, and I'm generalizing here as well. And, and I, you know, you guys will know uh, probably as much as me, if not more, about Eastern European unions, the smaller states, which are covered in the book, by the way. Um, do do have a look at do have a look at those as well. But generally, they they are an integral part of the party state operation, uh, apparatus. Their primary function uh, was not to represent class interests because class antagonisms didn't exist. They were certainly not uh, in theory and in paper. Of course, in reality, it's a very different story. But they weren't there to represent class interests. They were essentially there to maintain labour discipline to encourage the production drive, to encourage state-owned enterprises or the, to meet the targets of the plan and to administer state social welfare, welfare systems. Now, of course, as state, uh, you know, if we look at all of the countries in the world, but let's look at China and Vietnam, uh, the resources were very, very weak in, uh, in post-revolutionary times. Vietnam came was coming out of a uh, a massive imperial war that had devastated the country, war against imperialism rather, and Russia had come basically come out of two, 200 years of, of war and imperialism. So social resources, resources were not great, so if the union is in, is in charge of administering these resources, it's not a popular organisation. They weren't. You'll find in China I've interviewed workers who look back to the old days of, of, of pre uh, of the old command economy, and look back with, with and, and look back with a certain fondness for the union, and I think on a personal, relational basis that was the case. But in terms of what it managed to do, uh, both administering welfare, but also trying to get more welfare for its members, it was pretty limited, really. This doesn't mean that they didn't have the uses that they don't, they won't have. Uh, you know, there the, the were protective functions, and they were, but they were essentially around individualized. Uh, rep representing in, in, in low-level grievances, really. And of course, the monitor enforcement of, of the labor code and the labor law. So in China, that wasn't a particularly onerous task because there wasn't a labor law in China. In, in Vietnam, uh, there was a labor code, but again, it was, it, you know, it was, it was much more of a paper thing, time to really. Um, so in short, these, these were not representative organizations. They were directed organizations. So how do these organizations, uh, how, how does the, the market orientated economies impact on these, on these traditional norms? Well, what, the, what we try to do in the introduction of the book, and the book is very much a compromise between, you know, I think I'm pro, from, from Rudy's experience, global experience, and, 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 and possibly my own uh, uh, experience and, and, and politics, really, but, but we, where we found common ground is this myth of the double transition, what I would call the Clinton-esque myth, that, that somehow market reforms will 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 engender transition and engender, engender political democratization. So in in, ter in union terms, the myth is uh, that uh, the unions will, uh, will will be a, the transition is to private enterprise in capitalist relations. That that will come with a political democratization, and that the driver for that is competitive is competition, a competition for for resources that drive this dual political and economic tran transition. In terms of the normative values of of of, of uh, mainstream trade unions, Western mainstream trade unions, this is based on Convention 98 and 87 of the of the ILO, and these conditions. Are, are, are accepted without reservation. So I put without reservation in in uh, in italics there with emphasis, and, and there's a reason for that because let's take China. China is there's no doubt that the All China Trade ACFTU, the All China Federation of Trade Unions, facing working class arrest, unrest at home, increasing levels. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, but also international pressure. The China uh, is a member of the ILO. Um, uh, a founding member of the ILO and takes that role very, very seriously. So in, in many of those other foundations and even called principles and conventions, it very much wants to move towards that. It wants to adopt these norms. It wants to be seen as abnormative, if you like. Not with the issue of an 87 and freedom association. That is not the case. They, in fact, when China signed the International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, 
um, it put in a reservation on Clause 8D, which was over the right to organise. It said that workers will only have the right to organise under the restrictions or under the restrictions of Chinese trade union law, Article 10 of which restricts the right to organise. So you, you can organise a, a union, but it has to be affiliated to the ACFTU. The problems with that will come to in there. Um, uh, so the generalised assumption of the double transition has not been borne out in practice. So to go along old Fukuyama when he said in 1989 that history uh, that history has ended. That's it. It's over. You know the the capitalism gone. History is clearly not ended. If you look at the resistance of Chinese workers, <coughs> the class struggle in China and Vietnam, and to a lesser extent in Russia, um, this is not not the case. I mean, Eastern European or former Soviet. So it's uh, Eastern European countries. Again, it's a pretty mixed picture, but generally, <clears throat> it's not as if history has ended across any of them. And, and, and also, I think you know that the <coughs> class struggle, this this notion of class struggle as a driver of history, still has significant explanatory power. It can still help us to understand what is happening in Guangdong province, what is happening around these transitions. It can help us why in Russia, uh, the MPRA, uh, Regional Car Workers. Association alternative union that, that emerged in uh, as a radical alternative to the uh, FNPR, the former State Socialist Union. Uh, why why these things are important? How how we are to understand <coughs> the different transformations? Uh, and and I think too, as well, uh, you know, the myth comes home with the social democracy values, the fear of Bolshevik revolution. To be honest, to be honest, that the ILO and these normative normative uh, uh, values were, were uh, norms were, were based on. Uh, that has gone under huge change. It's come under huge attack from processes of neoliberalism, outsourcing, privatization, anti-trade union laws, um, um, the decline of collective bargaining, uh, bargaining and as I said, different forms of informalization. And I think I think it's Marcel, is it Lind Linden? Or, who actually, or maybe I'm thinking of Jan Bremer, but, but uh, of this notion that informalisation is really a form of class struggle from above. It's about in, imposing and breaking trade unions. And of course, more recently, as well, the rise of, oh, thank you, cheers, the, the rise of, of, of populism. I attended uh, and was privileged enough to speak at a conference in Hong Kong recently where we looked at authoritarianism and populism uh, across, there was a speaker from, from Turkey, a speaker from uh, from South Africa, China, uh, obviously Hong Kong as well, and, and and I spoke about my union strike, the UCU pension strike, and you know, it, was, it was really interesting to see to draw some of these uh, the, this rise of populism and, and suddenly the the strong man of politics, the strong man in inverted commas, is, is reasonably you know uh, uh, Modi in India, Xi Jinping in China, Putin in Russia, dare I say Erdogan in Turkey, um, Trump. The clown of the old crowd in in, um, in 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 the U.S. and that kind of uh, so so you know those those social social democratic values. And I don't mean that in, in the original sense of social democracy as a revolutionary idea, but as a uh, more like welfare capitalism um, that has uh, that has come under attack by this right under attack by populism. Um, uh, but, as I said, these transitions come across and they unfurl at different speeds and different scales. So how on earth are we going to categorize? How are we going to sort this out and mumble? Now, the book is long. It's nearly 500 pages long. So it's, it's not a bedtime read. Um, it, it's a read it, it is definitely meant as a reference book to, to draw comparisons, to challenge what's in there, to support what's in there. Whatever. So, but we, we did try and draw out a... a, 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 a I guess you call it a framework, really. So I'll try and try and explain an, an, an analytical framework as well. So we we came up with three strands. So new EU members who have met membership criteria, politically and geographically speaking, have looked to the West. So these are these are former uh, Eastern European or well, Eastern European countries, former command command economy countries that have very much have made it an aim to, to join the EU or to look to the EU, to look to Western or direct foreign investment from, from the West and Poland being the obviously example and you know from well I would argue quite promising, I know this is quite controversial, but I think there were promising aspects to Solidarsk. 
um, um, on the left of Solidarność. Solidarność wasn't just about yeah, uh, it wasn't just about um, Valencia. There were trends within that organisation. And then we got the former Commonwealth of Independent States, and and I think these states, these are Russian satellite states essentially, and these I would argue these are still remain more or less mired in the Chicago School of Big Bang of mass sudden privatization. Although in Russia we've seen, and I'll, again I'll pick on Russia here, we've seen the emergence of alternative, or two, two or three distinct waves of what I call in Russian parlance alternative trade unions, I, alternative to traditional uh, FNPR. Um, these have, for various reasons, these have ranging from I would probably argue from a, a deliberate influx of, of a massive amount of American money aimed at building a civil society in inverted commas in Russia that basically any three or any small organization that got together and said we're an NGO, we want to be a trade union could get American money. So this was on the surface a sort of like an attempt to build alternative trade unions. What it really did was 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 entirely split working class unity. Which is not to say that working class unity would exist under the FNPR, but it did split the working class, it split militants as well. And then you have China and Vietnam. So survival of the party state in the context of ongoing economic reform uh, and the dominance of uh, political or capital state relations. So no or very to say no political reform is, is too sweeping, no political significant change. It's still a one party state. Indeed, in, in, in China now, the, the restrictions on the ability to organize and to both organize workers, organize or to support workers in struggle is, is increasingly constrained. <clears throat> so, each of these three, so we've got three categories, and these are very broad, and do feel free to challenge them, and, and of course, there are, there are crossovers. And we, we put these. Um, Across, uh, in fact, so, you know, these these generate distinct systems of, of labour relations. So the so the traditional or the Western model, really post World War II Europe, where labour unions basically that they price fix wages on the labour market. They're there to they're not there. They're not politically. They're not there to end capitalist labour relations. They're there to ameliorate them. To take as uh, at their best to take Polanyi, as Polanyi said, to take labour out of the orbit of the market. Uh, these were not Marxist organisations. They are lobbying openly for pro-labour, uh, pro-worker laws, uh, and um, uh, yeah, expanding, you know, and to, to reduce the commodification of labour. Um, and as I said, these come under these these values come under huge processes associated with neoliberalism. Uh, then we have this interesting model, and uh, what we call the social partnership model. Now this is this is really the model that have been let's look at adopted in Russia, really where uh, Shmachov, uh, who the General Secretary of FNPR until quite recently, I think, or maybe he's still, yeah, still is rather, but in, when he took over in 1993, after a deal with Yeltsin, um, you know, he said it's there in writing in, 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 in Spark, in his letter, the Russian newspaper, saying that uh, this is no longer the period for class struggle, this is social partnership, we are not interested in class struggle. So this is the, the new, this is the FNPR realigning itself with a, with a change reconfiguration of, ruling, of, of the ruling class, but nevertheless the FNPR. And it's a long, complex struggle, that, which maybe we can discuss a little bit, with ups and downs, but um, it, it threw its lot, lot in, really, with, with that social partnership. And this social partnership as well, and there, there are reasons that it did to, which, which we'll come to, but, uh, as active as a constraint on the alternative unions that have emerged in the, in the CIS states. In the alternative unions, uh, they tend to be full of um, uh, very active, often very courageous in the, uh, militants working at, at shop floor level uh, who, who are more interested in strikes, who really have no choice to organise but to organise strikes rather than uh, other kind of less militant forms of, of, of activity, uh, of union activity. Because the, as part of the deal between Yeltsin and the FNPR, the, the reformatted state socialist unions, part of the deal that the FNPR gained the major, wherever it existed, because it was a much bigger organisation at enterprise level, it, it won the right to collective bargaining. And this was, this was confirmed in the 2001 Labour Code. So 
uh, smaller, so it's basically if the FNPR existed in the enterprise, it would always be the biggest. It has 20 million members, it has a tradition of mass, mem mass membership, it's not mass activity. So simply by its presence, it was able to dominate collective bargaining. This pushed alternative, certainly the weaker alternative unions, into, into a cycle of, of militancy and, and I would say individualized exhaustion as well. There were breakthroughs, particularly in the car plants as well. Uh, less so around the, oh, and 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 there were uh, railways, uh, you know, key key sectors where workers can can exercise significant um, uh, association or structural power. On that, as so we call it. Um, and thirdly, is the, the existence of party-led trade unions. Now, the ACFTU is the biggest the Australian Federation of trade unions. If we if we accept briefly that it is a trade union, I would say that it doesn't really function like a trade union, and certainly not in my interpretation. Um, these these are monopolistic trade unions. Um, they, this has survived, but it doesn't mean these uh, monopoly trade unions, but mon monopolistic, that they are not. There, there are not power relations in it, they don't vary. Russia, China is a huge country. There are different forms of how they relate to local capitalists and, and, and local local government classes. So um, uh, there, there are localized experiments driven by class struggle that, that vary these big monopoly unions. Um, and also, what is also quite interesting, what some of my research showed certainly until uh, in, the, in the first decade of the century, was that they're often, particularly when class struggle reached a peak, they, these unions were often able to make use of their relationship with the party, either to broker localized deals around wage tables or some kind of form of collective negotiation, or to put through, on paper, very good labor laws. The Chinese labor law on paper is, is, is an excellent book, on, on, you know, apart from one or two clauses around who can organize the trade union law in China on paper is a good law. Less, same, same for Vietnam as, as well. Um, so the, the you know, party-led unions, they are monopoly, do have a monopoly, but they, they're not monopolistic. There's a typo there, they just they're not monopolistic. So we've got these, these kind of different categories, um, uh, generating different types of labor relations, reacting to different relating to class struggle in different ways. And so we're trying to do, bring all this together, we've kind of put an analytical com compass together, which I'll go back to when, when we look through Vietnam, we looked at Vietnam really. So four levels of trade union transitional and institutional integration. One is to what extent have party-led unions made a transmit, formerly party-led trade unions made a transmission, uh, made a, a transition from being a role as a transmission belt, transmitting ideas and production plans from the center and workers used back up, at least in theory, to autonomous organizations. Um, from being administrators of social insurance and welfare distribution to collective bargaining and wage setting. Okay? And from, from uh, being linked to, to very closely allied to the concept, conceptually, uh, to the notion of integrated interests, in a command economy to the impose, opposing interests of capitalist labor relations. Of course, there are bl blurred, line, blurred lines across all this, and there is, you know, it's never a simple thing, and I'm sure there will, there will be experts, and maybe yourselves will read the book and think, well, they've got it wrong, I'm hungry. Hopefully you'll think, I've got it right in China, but maybe you'll think it's nonsense, I don't know, but, but you know, like, it, you know, when, that's the whole point of the book, really, to generate, or well, one of the points of the book is to kind of generate, to keep these, the I to keep labor on the page, to keep working class, working classes on the page. Uh, so for example, blurred lines, so trade unions active in countries within the EU, uh, you know, in some states have become dependent on party politics and alliances. Um, uh, the habits of democratic centralism around which command economy unions profess to operate, and it's a very loose definition of, of democratic centralism with the emphasis on centralism rather than democracy, um, and these generate by nature, by almost by political default, weak enterprise level trade unions. So although they gain strength, as I said in the previous slide, from their relationship with the party, um, at the enterprise level, particularly the capitalist private enterprise level, they're incredibly weak. They, uh, they are dependent on employees. And this has been, uh, Simon Clark and myself in a book where we, we looked at, chart, we you know, did this uh, 10 years ago. This is a kind of, in some ways, a, a catch up, but a slightly different framework for sure. Um, uh, we, we, we argued back then, and I would argue it's still the case, 
that the major constraint on working class militancy in, not necessarily institutional organisation in, say, Vietnam and China now, is, is not the absence of freedom of association because workers are organising and they are taking strikes. Admittedly, they can't change that. They're, they're cut, they're, they're, they are to a greater or lesser extent trapped in what Eli Friedman called an insurgency trap, in, in short that once a, a strike is won or lost, there's nowhere for that collective narrative to go because it certainly won't go to the ACFTU or the VTCL, the party-led union, they, they won't be interested in that narrative. So, so there is a, a weakness there, but nevertheless, in both those countries, workers generally win strikes. You know, at a cost, you know, people are arrested sometimes in prisons, but, but, but they do they win them. So the, the, those habits of demographic centralism, they, they, they create weak enterprise level trade unions. Uh, and, uh, and, and also, I think, worth remembering uh, you know, around these, this lack of uh, this heterogeneity is social, the social democratic union model. You know, you know, union, my, my union is, is, is hierarchical. I think we saw, you know, my union is the UCU. Uh, I've been involved in three other unions. Um, uh, but but you know, for all its recent energy during the pension strike, and for all its ability, uh, all its ability of all, it's sort of, uh, ordinary union members to overturn a leadership decision to accept a deal from the from the from the universities UK during the strike, but nevertheless, I think the strike in the end was essentially called up too early, because and unions are by default often hierarchical anyway. So, uh, okay, so let's look at um, and also finally on 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 this uh, another thing is that legal frameworks, although unions are not. I would argue should never be restricted or constrained by legal, 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 com, legal, by the law. Sometimes it is necessary to break the law in, to, in, in terms of a struggle, particularly when employers or, or the state are behaving duplicitously. But nevertheless, even if you stay within legal frameworks, a different legal framework can have a direct impact on union behaviour. Often, the reverse of what you might think as well. So, if you answer, if you look at in Russia, there is the right to organise. But we see far more strikes in Vietnam, so a much more militant working class in Vietnam and in China. So the, the case study I'm going to look at, and how are we doing for time? Uh, uh, so, so, uh, I'll give it, I'll give it another 10, ten, ten so, Okay, so, right, so Vietnam. So Doi Moi, uh, just quickly, it's a quick, quick context. Uh, Sixth Party Congress, 1986, and the emergence of new, new property rights, a restructured, gradually restructured state center. Again, nothing like a Russian big bang, uh, Chicago big bang. Uh, various forms of foreign, uh, foreign enterprise and direct investment have, have emerged through these new property rights. Currently, 18% um, of uh, Vietnam's GDP is from uh, foreign direct investment, and 39% of its GDP is from Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese, from Vietnamese capital, uh, Vietnamese enterprise. Uh, Vietnamese companies, firms, enterprises, etc. Private. private, yeah, private, yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, this has generated this return of, of capitalist labour relations has, has, has generated a dramatic and variegated rise in strikes. We'll come back to that in more detail. And as I said, it's also uh, the VGCL has remained politically strong but weak at the workplace, organisationally weak. And there is there is an interesting debate uh, or trends in the literature over the fact that uh, whether the VGCL has adapted better to capitalist labour relations than, say, the ACFTU in China. Um, I would argue that that is not the case. But there is a kind of, I think, emerging out of the, uh, the, the imperialist war and Vietnam's victory o o over the US in that war, I think there is, a, there is a sympathy, a default sympathy towards Vietnam, towards the struggles of Vietnam, more so in China. Uh, you know, this is anecdotal, I can't prove this. Uh, but also, I think as well that um, the VG South is very interesting doing research and talking to the union people in these countries. Um, you go to China and the, the strikes are still as sensitive, although they become to a certain extent normalized because they happen so often, they're still a sensitive issue. Not something that you. So it, it is changing, but generally over the last twenty years, to talk about strike would, would, would be something quite sensitive. Although that has changed, I have to say. Uh, in the VG cell, completely different. You, you interview a VG cell uh, uh, 
cadre or official or, or enterprise level uh, representative, and the first thing they'll talk about is strikes, i.e. how to stop them, how to prevent them, not build them, I should add, not win them in some ways. But, but um, uh, So there, there is that change as well. So the, 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 so 18% of GDP uh, comes uh, from the private, uh, the FDI, it comes from the foreign domestic, uh, foreign or joint venture. Um, and this is concentrated in three or four export se export orientated sectors. And you can see here that although these, this investment is only 18% of the total GDP, uh, uh, G, uh, our total GDP, they still create, they still dominate these sectors, and you can see. Um, I can send these slides to you guys. Uh, please send, please send them around. Yeah, um, and you can see that in, in more more detail there. So, so FDI produces a significant uh, amount of uh, value in China, in, in Vietnam. Same goes for China, less so in Russia because of the nature of more extractive industry. Wage workers here, I think. The, the key thing to, to look at here is that foreign, is, is this one here, foreign invested enterprises, the, the, this one, still only employs 10% of uh, Vietnam's 40 million uh, wage workforce. Um, most of that workforce is informal, only, only a small minority is in, in formal, formal work. Whereas 23% um, for private enterprise there, uh, and work, uh, for, uh, accounting for wage and employment, um, and yet, those private enterprises form, be they formal or informal, regulated or non-regulated, they form 90% of, of, the num of the number of registered companies in Vietnam. Uh, what about the unionization in the foreign invested enterprises? Uh, we'll, we'll come to that, we'll come to that, yeah, but it's, it, it tends to be, uh, we, we found it very hard, in the book there will be some figures, but it's hard to put exact figures on, 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 on this because it formally being formally unionized often doesn't mean that the union is actually quite quite the reverse really but union coverage is generally fairly high collective bargaining coverage in uh, and the same goes for china as well the union coverage is generally seen as high but often many workers will be will be union members and will only find out they're union members when they see their payslip uh, because they're too clear. it's not organizing in, in in the way i've organized anyway so or many unions so um uh, and, and also in terms of collective bargaining agreements. In China, you'll see huge coverage, 70% or more, of, between 50 and 70% of workers in, in, in of formerly, formerly employed workers are covered by some form of collective agreement. Again, many will have nothing to do with that process, it won't be known. Um, there are very important exceptions to that. And the same goes for Vietnam, although Vietnam, and this goes back to the recent changes, changed the methodology on how it collected statistics on collective bargaining, uh, which, to, to make it a more realistic thing, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So, so yeah, the structure, I won't, I won't spend too long on this, but um, you can see the most important thing about this little graph or the table is, and you can see, so this is money coming from a firm level. So union dues, 1% uh, of the basic salary of union members, uh, goes to the enterprise union. 60% uh, uh, of that goes to the enterprise union. Another 40% goes to the next, next level above. Union. This is union tax. Uh, it's a 2% of basic wage fund of organised enterprises. So 65% of this goes to the union, local union, enterprise level, and 35%, and, and so 65, 35 goes to the upper level union here. This is really interesting. Is and, and I think this is really this is from 2013 I think uh, and and I think this is really in response to possibly the emergence or one of the responses of the emergence uh, of possible alternatives to the VTCL as TPP began to hove into view began to move into view so you had a union tax of two percent of basic wage fund on unorganised enterprises as well. Is it the uh, employers who pay. The oh yeah, it's the same point. Yeah, yeah, the same point. You, 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 the union due is one percent. This is paid by members. So uh, this and this, this, this tax again was part of an attempt to make collective bargaining more effective, because what collective bargaining in Vietnam and also mostly in China, so what, what these agreements tend to produce is just a, a duplication of minimum labour laws. Often, sometimes, they'll produce standards that undermine minimum labour 
as well. So this was part of an attempt to get this seen. And why? Because enterprise level unions are very weak, as I, as I tried to emphasize. This is an attempt to bring in the political power of higher city level, district, industry level unions into, into being able to generate stronger collective agreements. And, and there has been some, some minor success on that. Um, but why are there so many? So, you know, why, why are the strikes in Vietnam? Why doesn't Labour dispute resolution? A form, there is a form of Labour dispute resolution system in Vietnam. Unlike the one in China, workers use it in China. Um, they use, 50 or 60% when they use it goes to mediation, arbitration, and then the courts. When they do use it, certainly if you get to arbitration over 50, 60%. Between 40 and 60, the cases will be won, depending, well, I would argue, on the balance of class forces in that given period, but it changes. But generally, it's, it's a process that, that can produce results. It's individualized, of course. Um, in Vietnam, workers do not use the formal system of labor. They're not remotely interested in it. Um, it doesn't work. They, they, can, they pretty much ignore it, really. And that's a, I think that's a key difference. Um, uh, the, the VG cell, the, whereas the ACFDU in China has been able to channel uh, some, at least some, unrest into these judicial bureaucratic procedures. In Vietnam, they have totally failed. Workers are not interested. Um, so this has led to the failure of the system. Has led to the moments of kind of uh, semi-formal uh, strike task things. That this this uh, group, Melissa, this is the. Uh, Ministry of Labour, basically, uh, Labour, uh, Invalid and Social Affairs, it has local branches called Dolista as well, and they began to form strike task forces uh, in visiting strike actions, sometimes with a union member involved, going down to the action and trying to, try to resolve the strike rather than go through this formal resolution procedure which workers were interested in. And, and in this, we've seen that uh, in, in China and also in Vietnam, that we've seen strikes that prioritise uh, interests uh, over rights, sorry, that should be over, over the rights, uh, uh, over individualised rights. So we've seen you know, labour relations generating a, a, a very much a collective, uh, increasingly collectivised class, uh, class interest there. And that is also the case uh, for China as, uh, as well. Um, these, uh, these, there have been other experiments as well, we'll come back to, to them, but particularly around collective bargaining and sometimes in China on union accountability, union elections in the workplace. In Vietnam, uh, and one of the chapters, Wolfgang Dorber in the book, uh, he talks very interestingly about an emergence between uh, almost a division of labour between the formal union and the emergence of informal worker militant networks. And these are quite exciting groups of groups of, of, of worker activists really, and whereas the, the union will do all the welfare work, it will do all the official formal work, but the informal leaders will organise strikes, and they are by far the, the more, more effective way of, of winning ground at the workplace, really. Um, the two don't tend, there is a debate in literature, and indeed in the book, of the amount of cooperation between those two networks, two, two structures really. I would argue that there probably isn't much in China you would see absolutely no cooperation, or very, very little. The, the, the Guangdong Federation of Trade Unions in South China in a more, more, more open time to the last decade did make some, make some, some approaches to labor NGOs rather than alternative, rather than workers' networks. Um, but but, in, uh, but since then, it, it will have nothing to do with them. There's no link, no turnover, really. In Vietnam, um, it's not so sensitive, but the VG cell has failed to go through that process as the unions do, which is to co-opt co the militants, really. That hasn't happened. So therefore, all strikes. So you can strike in China, in, in Vietnam. In China, it's more, more you can in Russia. In China, it's a little bit. It's, it's, uh, you have the, the right to, you, you, the right to strike is not protected in law. It's not, no, in no law to say you cannot strike, but it's not protected. In Vietnam, it's different. You have the right to strike, but it's protected in law. But because the union, the law makes it so difficult to organize a strike, the, the workers will simply not bother. They, they will go, they'll go through these networks, these informal networks, or simply go on strike as well. And I would, if you're interested in stuff, my PhD 
assume Joe Buckley, who I mentioned before, will, will be producing literature on this and, uh, and, and will take this to a much more sophisticated level, I think, really. But so, the, you know, so all strikes are wildcat. As far as I know, the union has not organized one single strike in the last, since 1995, or since, in, since Neumann. And you can see here, there's a link there with inflation. It is linked to inflation, but you can see, on average, from 2001 to 2014, and that average has gone up since then. You see it's gone out, it's gone up again since. Um, we're looking at about, uh, on average, between uh, about eight, or she, in the literature in the book, she's had 900 strikes a year, depends when you, when you take it from. So, significant around uh, um, labor militancy, really. 70% of those strikes are in foreign <coughs> owned or joint ventures, in that 10% of, 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 of GDP, really. 24% are in Vietnamese private inter enterprises. Very rarely do they take place in state-owned enterprises. That's a very complex area. Maybe we want to discuss that and why that's the case. Also interesting, and this is about the fact that unionizing a workplace in Vietnamese terms by no means excludes the possibility of strikes. In some ways, it increases it because 70% of strikes are on unionized enterprises. Now, there's a chap called Mark Anna, uh, an American uh, researcher who's worked with Vietnamese uh, researchers as well, who's written a very interesting uh, thesis where he thinks that despite, even though the VTCL unions are very passive, are very kind of um, traditional in their approach, welfare dominated rather than uh, collectivist, um, nevertheless by, uni by unionizing an enterprise, um, you're sending a signal to workers, you're actually sending a signal to workers to, to be more militant. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but it's a very, very interesting idea I think as well mainly because it gives a significance, there's a massive debate in the literature over union reform across all the countries and the extent of union reform and, 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 and how, and you know, if these, if these old trade union structures can, can make that transition, or well, so maybe some people think they shouldn't do. Uh, no, this is ILO, 90% strikes, I mentioned that, in, in, uh, sorry, an impartial or complete picture. So it works. No wonder workers don't go through the formal labour dispute grievance procedure because it doesn't work. It's bureaucratic. It takes months. This 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 works far better. Why are the unions so weak? Well, it's not just because they're party-led trade unions. There is a default dependency on employers uh, in in the workplace. Union reps or union cater in the workplace are often paid by the employer. If they do happen to start being a little bit vocal or something, they're, they're subject to dismissal. There have been calls by the VGCL to revise the Labour Code accordingly uh, or, or make additional payments to union reps in, in times of, if they are laid off. Um, but as I said, these unions don't organise strikes. Uh, and it, when they do happen, the higher level union will step up. It will attempt either working with the local Ministry of Labour to use political, political power both to pressure workers and to discipline capital. It will, particularly foreign capital. Yeah, it, 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 will, it will do that. Um, in, in terms of a, a more kind of more interesting response really to labour militancy, I think that, um, uh, that uh, unions, that, as I said before, this, this has been an attempt to, to introduce uh, what, what she calls real and successful bargaining in the book. I, I think she's a little bit enthusiastic there, uh, over enthusiastic. But, but nevertheless, the, the 2012 legal, legal code um, extended uh, bargaining rights to non-unionized enterprises, which you can see in that chart there, which is, explains that, that tax going from this one, going from non-unionized enterprise to the upper level union. That was an attempt to force uh, particularly foreign ventures, foreign joint ventures, uh, to, to engage in collective bargaining. They have tried to train collective bargaining negotiators, but we're, we're talking about fairly low numbers here. Uh, there's more attention on the content of collective bargaining agreements. So instead of just duplicating the law or even undermining it, you know, they'll, they'll include a bonus, a New Year's bonus, a transport subsidy, additional accident insurance. And, and the union has there's actually, and this, this is, you know, for, 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 for a former command economy union, this is, this is quite interesting. It's changed the way that it has collated the data. So we'll, we'll only, it looks at, it's looked at a thousand 
collected contracts since 2015 and found that 15% are significantly better and 29% are better than the minimum legal standard. If, if a, a collected contract does not exceed minimum legal contract, it's not counted in collected bargaining figures. So that's very different from China. Russia is a more complex thing, maybe we can discuss that. But from China, basically any agreement goes into the stats, so you get huge coverage, which means nothing. In, in Vietnam, coverage was, before they changed the criteria, made this reform, it was at 52%, it dropped right down to 23%. But at least that 23%, they, they are agreements that mean something in terms of, of, of benefits, economic benefits, at least for workers. Um, <clears throat> still, the majority of them still duplicate minimum labor standards. In terms of wages, um, both in China and in, in Vietnam, less so in Russia now that the oil boom is over, wages uh, have, been, have been going up. In both countries, wages tend to be, except in sectors where workers possess significant amounts of structural or logistical power, such as dot workers in, in China, and I've written about that recently, um, wages tend to get, get tied to uh, minimum wages, so that, that forms a, a, an apparent ground level. So, and, and that means that the state really is involved in fixing pretty much wage levels increases across the board, because if the minimum wage level is seen as a floor, and that's where it's fixed, then any improvement will be tied to that. So that awards the state uh, a, a key role in wage fixing. And if we go back to those normative, those norms of, of uh, mainstream trade unions in, 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 in Western countries, whereby their role is to fix wage, wages and wage, wage prices in a labour market, this is not that model. The state, by fixing minimum wage, so I'll say it's a good or a bad thing, it's just how, 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 how it is. It, you know, some people that I've, I've talked to that say this undermines the ability for unions or labour networks to, to develop undermine bargaining it. There's a fallback on the state. I don't buy that, but I think it's a, an interesting argument. So if we go back, and I'll end, end on this slide. Thank you for your patience. I, I, I'm droned on too much. Let's go back to that analytical compass. When we look at Vietnam, I mean, if we had time, we could go through all the country, but, um, and, and maybe in the discussion we can a bit more as well. So there's four levels of trade union transition and institutional integration. In integration. So part, part from a, transmission from a, a transition from a party level transmission belt to autonomous organizations. Well, in, in Vietnam, I think we've seen, as I said, the emergence of wildcat strike networks and the VGC, on the one hand, and the VGCL pretty much, and certainly until TPP came onto the horizon, stuck in the headlines. TPP did give it a boost in terms of it's got to increase its performative, uh, perform performance around representation, but that, that impetus has now gone, and, and the, the only reason why it needs to reform or needs to brush up its act really is because of class struggle. I think that will continue to drive it, but as, for all the reasons I talked about, that, that will remain slow. And Dorgler in the book, he argues that there is in fact a division of labour and almost a compromise, right? We'll, we'll leave the networks alone, and particularly if they focus on foreign and joint ventures, uh, because they'll drive up wages and consumption there, and we'll get the BGCL to keep a lid on things politically and welfare-wise. Second part of the compass. From hierarchical governance to democratic accountability and election of trade union reps. Um, in Vietnam, we saw the emergence, again, over issues of representation and strikes, how to reduce the strikes, the, a union charter. This, this has been, you know, like trying to make the VGCL unions more, more responsive to working class demands and interests and rights. That, that hasn't really made much process. On paper, it looked pretty good. On, I suspect the ILO was heavily involved in that, or, or maybe in, 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 you know, encouraged that, but in, in practice, it hasn't. Um, hasn't produced very much. These organisations and their CADA, have they moved from administrators to a welfare to collective bargaining, negotiating and wage setting? Well, some process, but it's still fixed around the state. The state still plays a major role, for better or for worse. And from integrated interest to opposing interest, the integrated interest of the command of the economy to the opposing interest, well, there is some shift on that. There is a recognition among, much more so than in China, 
and less influenced by that social partnership model in Russia that I talked about, which eschews entirely class struggle. In, in Vietnam, interestingly, and because I think the, Viet, the, Viet, the VGCL in Vietnam has two media organizations as well, or media newspapers, and you do get uh, articles and that written by senior figures who, who, which will say, yeah, we need to organize against capital. We need to, we need to, they even say we will need to organize strikes. They don't do it, but it's quite interesting that, that they will do that. I would say that as there's a different, you know, some awful academic term, but there's a different pathway going on here like the, the China and to Russia, obviously. I've linked a lot of that to the initial, uh, going right back to the founding of unions in Vietnam, and indeed that is contested. There, there are different versions of that, the relationship with the party, but also the, the, um, the, the, the Vietnam War as well. So there is, there is a, a recognition of interest, it generally channeled through a national lens. Interestingly, the, the, the enemy now, no, it's, it's very much seen as China. There were riot, riots or strikes rather quite recently over a, a, a reform to regulations in special economic zones. And China has a, has a lot of money in special economic zones in China. It wasn't the law and aimed in China where, where it was deemed, where many protesters deemed that the state was awarding too much power to foreign investors to either, I forget what the exact issue was. I'm still researching it, but... Is there a lot of Chinese investment yes, in Vietnam? Yeah. I don't have the figures, but yes. So mm. these these strikes or these protests were very much directed against Chinese uh, Chinese investors, linked to the dispute in the South Pacific over what are called the English term, the Spratly Island dispute, linked to oil exploration there. Um, and, and, you know, because China and Vietnam fought a... a, a all war is horrible, but a particularly nasty war in the late 70s. So, um, or uh, uh, with a lot of casualties. So, um, yeah, there, there, there is a group, but it tends to be through a nationalist lens. So, that's me done. I feel, I feel like I was, yeah, <laughs> good cure for an insomnia in me. But um, <laughs> please, um, please take that apart, criticize it. What have I missed? Yeah, please, let's open it. Thanks. Thank you very much. It was like a crash course. Yes. Um, it's happening. Any questions? I have some questions, but before I talk, I would like you to oh, start asking. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was fascinating, actually. Um, I just wonder if we also talk about the differences between these countries, but if we are talking in terms of similarities in these terms, transaction period, yeah. what can it be, or yeah, yeah. what can you say about this? For example, when I am working on the uh, translation uh, in Turkish case, uh, I saw, uh, I mean under neoliberalism, I saw the state is really has a much major role when uh, they shape the, not just the economy, and also the society in terms of the free market ideology. And they really do their best to pressure the trade unions and the formal and also the informal workers. And can we say for those countries, what is the role of the state? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, uh, should, should I answer one question at a time or take two or three? Do one at a time. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very big question. So to, to take the first one. Commonalities. Well, there are commonalities across certainly China and Vietnam, um, which uh, are around the absence of freedom of association, the presence of uh, authoritarian repression in many ways, and uh, the um, the limited capacity of state trade unions to conduct collective bargaining. So, in terms of, of, of union union behaviour. Um, I think the way, uh, and, and again, but these, these, these are very varied, but I think those, those commonalities exist. I, I, I think the, the, the role of the state in both countries as well, it's, there is a, it's really interesting. There's a, lots of debates in the literature around whether, for example, uh, Chinese reforms or Vietnamese reforms or neoliberal reforms um, uh, do, in, in terms of, do they deregulate? Well, it, I think it depends where you 
start from. So if you look at the introduction of the labour law in China in 1994, the first labour law in 1995 rather, that very much was, I would argue, a neoliberal law. It individualised labour rights, it de it deactivated the notion of collective class interests, it made it very diff difficult to do anything collectively, it was about the introduction of, of short-term contracts, it was about uh, it in, you know, it was about basically controlling through one mean or another, through other forms as well, a vast movement of off-farm uh, of, of off farm labour into special economic zones or township and village enterprises. I think, I think that was neoliberal in character. If you fast forward to 2008, and particularly uh, the class struggle of the first decade in, in, in this century in China, you have the introduction of the labour contract law, the labour dispute and arbitration, mediation and arbitration law, and later the labour employment law. These three laws, I would argue and have argued in the literature, in many ways bucked the neoliberal trend, which doesn't mean global, global trend, in that they seem to be, to all intents and purposes, an attempt to slow down the rate of informalisation in China. Um, it's not just me who argues that, others as well, uh, Mary Gallagher, Sarge Caravilla, um, and myself and others have, have argued this. I've argued that it's a response to class struggle. Now, of course, I can't make that argument deductively valid because they won't let you have the stats. There are no stats on, on, on class struggle in China, on strikes in China. But nevertheless, you can make a very inductively forceful argument that that is the case simply by, you know, I don't think those laws were introduced. Those laws which made it easier to become a permanent worker on paper, and they did shift the goalposts, they made it more difficult for employers to sack people. Um, Although the employers found a, w a way around that, I should hate to do that. So um, there was a, 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 a so the role of the state there, I think, w it was quite interesting. On the one hand, it's facilitating; it's the classic neoliberal state. It's facilitating capitalist labour, capitalist uh, labour exploitation. But on the other hand, it's in introducing laws that are going against this neoliberal trend, the weakening labour laws. The labour contract law was stronger than the collectively. And the labour, the labour law of 1994. So I think that that's that's quite interesting change. And, and and to simply, obviously, there is no neoliberal state, but there are, there are these are models. But uh, I don't think you can squeeze China in, in into that. Which doesn't mean to say that liberal neoliberal processes are not active in China. In Vietnam too, you have a similar thing where the the, the state has moved, probably to head off unrest or labour militancy. To, to not so much to slow the process of informalisation, because that has happened, but it's certainly uh, made, tr tried to try to re-channel strikes into judicial frameworks. Now, whether that's neoliberal or not is, is open to debate. I think what, what, one thing is clear, that if we, if we judge neoliberalism on the basis of a rollback of the state, Again, that's complex because so so the state has rolled back in, China in terms of in Vietnam in terms of welfare as it has in this country, um, but there again um, the state still plays a major part in labour relations. It, you know, it, it, it doesn't leave it to the to the unions alone because it knows the unions can't handle it. So it still it still gets involved for sure. Right now. So it's so I think I think I think for me the commonalities lie in 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 the fact that. I know it sounds a cliche, but the fact that, that working class demands and class struggles still remain a driver of history in these countries. The history has not ended. Neoliberalism has not just arrived by foreign direct investment. There are there is pushback, and sometimes the state too will become will, 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 will join in on that yeah, for its own reasons. Hi, um, three points. First one. <clears throat> is you refer to this book, I Came In Late, so um, okay. could you give me the title of that book you're referring to? Um, the okay. second point is at a time when uh, there's a threat of a major trade war between the US and China, effectively bringing about an end to the whole process of globalisation that has been building up over the last 30 years. Um, what effect would that have on the working class in, in Vietnam, China? Will it 
push them further into the arms of the one-party state, or would it actually open it up and weaken the one-party state and call, force the working class to actually engage in, in a more independent class struggle itself? And thirdly, I've looked at the, um, the stats in China and, and Vietnam, and um, they're not up to the same standards in, in the US or even what you get on the OECD stats yeah. website. Um, for example, in China, I can't find any sort of systematic uh, time series for capital, inventories, things like that. Is it the same with Vietnam, or is there plans for those economies to actually make those statistics more available mm -hmm. um, and bring them up to the level that the OECD publishes on, on an annual basis? Okay, okay. well, thanks for that. So, um, first of all, the book I mentioned was Industrial Upgrading in. Guangdong, G U A N D O N T, and by Florian Botello. Right, that's the one. That's the one. Okay. Uh, trade war, in, that's a really interesting question, as we were talking about that yesterday. Um, impact on the working class in, in China and Vietnam. Um, I don't think trade war will affect Vietnam the way it's affected China. I, I think Vietnam, uh, you know, Trump has clearly prioritised China. Um, uh, it will impact the economic livelihood of perceptions of the working class in China, definitely. Um, whether it will drive them, what impact that will have on militancy, uh, on the autonomy of that militancy, militancy, um, I don't know. Who, who, who knows? Um, uh, there's. I suppose in, in some ways it means that, you know, it's, just a, it's obviously a very political question to, you know, and, and I think it requires trying to, 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 to disaggregate the, the trends inside the labour movement in, in, and I think there is a labour movement in China still, despite some of the crackdowns we've seen recently. Um, and, and broadly speaking, there are Maoist trends, there are labour NGO type social democratic tends, and then this just kind of spontaneous working class struggle as well. I, I, I can't see, I haven't seen any signs of, I don't know, I haven't particularly been looking for them yet, but it's too, it's early days, that of, of the trade war and the economic impact on that, having, an, having a, a recognisable effect on, on those three major groupings. And when I say major, I mean major in the commas, because Recently, in, in, in a JSIC dispute in, in a welding plant in Pingshan, in, uh, in South China, in Guangdong province, there's been a, quite a lot of stuff in the news about that. Uh, a lot of Maoist reading groups and students have been involved in that. It's been quite interesting. Some of those groups weren't really around, but you know, the, uh, I was surprised at the amount, uh, amount of influence they were able to have on that dispute, but they've been cracked down on quite hard. So. Um, I, I, it would be spec it would be speculative to say my gut instinct says that we will continue to see a a uh, a focus on economic disputes and strikes that have occasional more political demands such as better representation such as um, re-election of a trade union chair we call the trade union chair in terms of the wider kind of movement wider. <coughs> feeling in, in and I'll focus on China here. There's no doubt that Xi Jinping is is a populist and popular leader in China. His attack on 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 corruption in China was well received by ordinary working people. But I think the social capital he's gained from that is beginning to dissipate a little bit. Around grumbling around well he didn't really go after his own people, he seemed to go after the Shanghai folks and rather his own people. Over the amount of money that's been poured into the Belt and Road Initiative. This is purely anecdotal. I can't prove this. This is conversations. You know, I can't. I have no stats on this. Um, uh, uh, um, basic trust has been quite a lot of work on on trust in local and central government officials in China. Trust still tends to be quite high among the central leadership, including Xi Jinping rather than local level government, uh, uh, local level party branches where there's a much lower level of trust. How this will change in the coming 
if the trade war continues and, and, and it, you know, global, global international relations and global balance of power does shift, it, it's a really interesting question, but, you know, let, let's see. I, I, I can't, in terms of what I suspect most of us are interested in here, I can't see, I could be completely wrong, so I don't want to speculate, but I haven't seen yet any signs that it's had a direct impact on how, how struggles are coming together. Yeah. But there, there again, I haven't spent... I haven't been in China for a significant amount of time. Last time was three months back in the end of 2016. Uh, maybe a bit of deeper research and, and conversations and uh, just being on the ground. But certainly among, among my networks, no, there's no, no people who are interested in it, but not, not, not a sign of generating a more autonomous movement. No. No. In, in, if anything, I expect the reverse. Stats, yeah, just very quickly Vietnam, uh, China. China's stats have actually, the cause has actually improved, but they feel not. Um, uh, in Vietnam, no, I haven't seen any. Yeah. I'm sure there are uh, there will be attempts that uh, China, Vietnam works with, with the IMF, works with the WTO, there will be attempts to do that, and, and other, but no, I haven't seen it. My, uh, if you want more information on that, leave me a contact. My, my PhD candidate and friend Joe will have more. Thank you. Uh, I thought it was very interesting. I want to ask a very specific question about wages in China, China right. compared to Vietnam, because we hear all the time about how uh, uh, the cost of labour in China is rising now, and uh, workers in some factories have equivalent living standards to Brazil and Mexico yeah. and Greece and that, that yeah. kind of level. Yeah. 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 And I wonder uh, how long has that been going on for? Because I remember people saying at the beginning of the millennium that Chinese wages hadn't really risen during the whole period, whole reform period. period. Uh, and if that was the case, at what point did wages actually start to rise in China? In China? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What are the drivers of that? Are they class strug, strug, struggle? Are they actually tightening of the labour market as so perhaps the supply of labour from the peasantry reduces. Is it actually the party deciding, the gov government deciding for political reasons that they need to give the citizenry uh, a stake in what's, hap hap in what's happening? And to what extent is it differentiated? Are there some sectors of the working class who are receiving wage rises while others are perhaps more the more informal sectors aren't, so I'd be interested in that. And is, can you detect the same phenomenon happening in Vietnam at all? Because often it's said that um, Chinese are diverting uh, investment to get to Viet to Vietnam and elsewhere in Asia to take advantage of low wage wages there. Okay. Uh I, I would argue that you pretty much answered the question with those with class struggle, uh, um, tightening labour market, and party policy. Um, I, I can I, I can enrich that a little bit. Uh, this is wages in China. Uh, wages in China did not go up hardly at all between seventy eight and uh, also no. Let's let's be more accurate here. Between let's say ninety two and two thousand and two two thousand and three, hardly any shift at all. In uh, from 2002 onwards, as the labour market tightened, uh, as workers became more aware of that, I can remember interviewing a a factory owner making of all things yoga mats, millions and millions of yoga mats uh, in in a special economic zone in Shenzhen, in South China, and she this was about 2005. She would not let her employees take the local. Guangzhou evening or Shenzhen evening news into the dormitory because they were going to read about labour shortages. Mm -hmm. and, and so these so-called passive peasant women coming off the farms who didn't know anything, and that, 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 that racist stereotype, that was stereotype very much in, in, in China as well, was, you know, was then and is nonsense. So she, she was, you know, so, and, and workers have taken advantage of that. The, uh, uh, and, and, of that tightening of that structural power that uh, you know, the, the, the what does Silver call it workplace uh, market but market bargaining power. Um, 
For sure, yeah, and that's one of the driver. And again, party policy, uh, you know, that had, particularly under the previous uh, government, who's in town, went about, there was a concern about uh, a rising uh, Gini coefficient, and that's not a very good measurement, but, you know, the inequality was growing. So, although wages and standards of living were going up within that inequality was growing dramatically, and, and the party was concerned about that. Not just because of labour unrest, although labour unrest did form a significant part of the 187,000 la or collective, they're called, should be called incidents in Chinese, collective incidents, which is usually means more than, I think it's 20 or 30 people together, uh, demonstrations. Uh, Labour was accounted for a third of that, but you know, there were riots in the countryside, there were police stations being burned down by, there were, so the agricultural tax was, was cancelled to relieve burdens on farmers. So, yeah, it was driven by politics, by tightening labour markets, rising class struggle, and the only factor I would add to that was, particularly in the, in the notion of industrial struggles, was, and especially in Guangdong, and I, I've written about this, not everybody agrees with me, but there was a role, uh, you know, the, the labour movement in, or in Guangdong was very much a trendsetter, very much ahead of the curve, really, in terms of both the number of strikes, the ability of strikes to, to ability to last, there was a famous Honda strike in 2010 that lasted for 19 days that set off a strike wave across uh, auto parts and auto factories. Um, uh, so Guangdong had this reputation. Um, I would say that was uh, that that reputation was it wasn't driven it was certainly driven by class struggle but but it was it was embellished in a way by two factors. One is the presence of Hong Kong labour NGOs. That weren't, they certainly weren't organising in Guangdong because they'd end up in prison, but they were able to carry out trade union education, they were used to dealing with, with capitalist employees, with Hong Kong investors in, in Guangdong. So I think they made a significant contribution, although very small in scale, to, to that shift from just individualised rights to collective rights. Although I think you know, workers themselves played a key, key role in that. So I think, but I think that's an important side. And also, I think, the presence in, in, in Guangdong and in Shenzhen of reformist-minded trade union leaders of, of, of the party trade unions. So, Chako Chen Wei Guang in, of the Guangdong Federation of Trade Unions, uh, Kung Sha Ha of the Guangdong Federation of Trade Unions in Shenzhen, uh, Wang Tongxin, the deputy leader of the Shenzhen Federation of Trade Unions, said strikes are normal, what's the big deal, as long as not political, we don't need to get worked up, we don't need to lock people up about this as long as nothing's broken. So this was a, a significant shift, so that, that drove those, the, those wage, wage, wage rises. Uh, both minimum wage and average wage. Do some sectors get more? Yeah. St sectors where there is fewer ter lower turnover, I mean, you know, this is very familiar to all, lower turnover, uh, um, where migrant workers have been able, such as the docks around Yentian, now the biggest port, or the second biggest port in the world in Shenzhen, where they managed to sink routes despite restrictions on, on residence permits, and I won't go into that, but the state restrictions on resident, residency, residency rights, they've managed to put down routes. So wherever workers have managed to put down routes from the countryside, that's driven, driven higher wages as well. Is the same process happening in Vietnam? I don't think labour shortages have been quite as tight. I think that, um, that there has been a shift that, that capital, Chinese capital has gone to Vietnam, it's also gone to Bangladesh, uh, it's gone to, to Ethiopia. Ethiopia, and well, Angola is a bit different, but uh, Tanzania. Um, so, you know, along this Belt and Road, and before Belt and Road as well, this, uh, this initiative. So, in, in Vietnam, I think what drove, uh, um, I think those first three factors the two, uh, were more important. The, the existence of the strike factors, I, I, I said, uh, tightening labour market, less so. Party policy, definitely. Um, uh, there was a temp, you know, there was a recognition that wages needed to go up, and often the state would encourage that uh, would put up minimum wage. So after the 2016 minimum wage rise was six was 12.6 percent. Union argued for 16 percent. That was from the National Wage Council. So, but what you didn't see in Vietnam was the presence of external actors such as labour NGOs, which which expanded so dramatically in, in China. 
and are now being repressed and pushed back. And uh, instead, you saw labour ne network quite 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 well organised networks of labour workers themselves. Whereas in, in China, that didn't emerge. I think because the Chinese state is generally more repressive. So that doesn't completely answer the question, but but I think you you know it, yeah. it, it puts puts yeah a, a bit of meat on. But yeah, those three factors you I just add those two extra ones. I have some uh, one remark concerning exactly that question and some questions. Uh, as far as I read from some Western uh, media, there was a very fierce competition between cities, districts, sectors because of labor shortage. Yeah, yeah. So that is one of the reasons the uh, upward uh, pressure uh, for the wages yeah. because they don't want to lose Guangdong workers to Absolutely. somewhere else. Yeah. With, the, with all that experience. But that will that. also show us that the labor, uh, how do you say, uh, li liberal market conditions are quite uh, strong in uh, China. So workers can change work, jobs, like m maybe not like here, but they can go from Guangdong to yeah. Shanghai or Beijing. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the restrictions, okay. but the restrictions are mostly about agricultural people leaving for cities, mm -hmm. I suppose. Uh, my question is this, uh, actually we have talked very little about uh, Russia, mm -hmm. but what happened in Soviet Union was that Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, it has collapsed. Yeah, so whole societies has, have almost disintegrated. And the unions, when the communist parties disintegrated, it is the unions who can keep the society. Maybe that explains why in today's Russia, unions more function like the social cohesion force mm -hmm. for whatever left from the okay. collapse. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, maybe uh, you can tell us more about that. My question was this, uh, you talked about trade union activities in Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, and uh, China and party controls the very high or uh, not so high. Mm -hmm. But what about the other way? The, the, there is lots of activity in the mass grounds of the uh, unions. How is it reflected inside the party? How do you find uh, the reflection of these activities in the party organization, party cadre, cadres, party policies and so on, both in Vietnam and uh, in China? Uh, for example, do the party leaders discuss a lot of union problems or do they not pay any attention to that at all? And uh, are the unions sending their uh, trainees, apprentices to West? Mm -hmm. yeah. Not necessarily America, but mm -hmm. maybe uh, ILO mm -hmm. in Switzerland yeah. or England. Or what do they learn from here? I don't know. Okay. All right. Uh, wow. Okay. So let's uh, start from the top. So Russia and the collapse and whether whether the old uh, socialist trade unions provided s some form of social cohesion for what was ever left. I, I think, yeah, there is, there is something in that. I, I think that the, in terms of being able to build on that, I, I think the, the, the problem was this conceptualization of social partnership. But that basically, in the deal that Yeltsin and the old state socialist trade unions hatched in 93 that then bore fruit later on the Labour Code in 2001, which was about bargaining rights at enterprise level. Um, uh, the, the, the deal was, right, we will make sure you get bargaining rights, we'll make sure that alternative unions that are coming up are not able to dislodge your, your, pri your primacy. And maybe the state had an interest in that social cohesion that you talk about, for sure. Um, but I think the price was social partnership, and I think 
what social partnership has done has restricted the FNPR, the main, the form of state union, which is still the most dominant union in, 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 in Russia, or union confederation chair, is, has restricted its attempts to, to, to respond more efficiently to, or more effectively to class struggle. Okay. In that it, it um, you know, it'll roll out its members on May Day. Uh, but more patriotic. Yeah, it's patriotic. Uh, it's, um, it, it, it's not, it's certainly not interested in challenging the state uh, or Putin, rather there is an ongoing deal with the, with the, with the party there. Um, so yeah, I, I don't disagree with you about that that cohesion and those desperate times that followed the the, 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 the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and that you know, you know tragedy that fell the Russian middle class. Um, but I think then in '93 when Shmakov announced we are social partnership, we are with this government by hook or by crook, then then basically we tied its own hands. Um, yeah. Survival of the state, whatever yes. left of it. Yes, I yeah. think so. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. that. I think it's a good way to Yeah. So union activities organize. Uh, yeah. And that, this is a really interesting point. But union activities organize and their, their influence on party policy. Yeah, they do. The, 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 that relationship, although the party tends to dominate in China, it definitely dominates. In, in Vietnam, it's a little bit more complex. Um, but in China, yeah, the unions are have, you know, as I said, a trade union law. Labour law, labour contract law in China on paper looks good, and you, and there's no doubt that the unions are able to influence party policy, influence the, the way those legal frameworks are due to show the grievance resolution procedures, which are generally, though they're very bureaucratic, they tend to find in favour of workers as a whole, and workers in Vietnam don't use them. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that is because the party is able to, uh, is responsive to union l lobbying, if that's the right word, I'm not sure it is. Um, Xi Jinping in 2013 and in 2015 has demanded, uh, is definitely interested in the issue of union representation in, in, in China, uh, has demanded blueprint, blueprints for reform that haven't really, one in in Shanghai, one in Chengdu in the west, uh, west of China. Um, but yeah, it's the, there is some stuff emerging now, some arguments emerging that actually, that, and this goes back to very interesting debates both in Vietnam and in China, particularly in the 50s in China, over the role of state socialist trade unions, over whether they should be autonomous uh, from the party or be a transmission belt for the party. And there, there was a serious debate about this back in the 50s. Um, I, won't, I won't go into it. I'll bore you all to death with the details of that. But um, uh, the, the, there was a fear then, and some are arguing there's a renewed fear now that, that the ACFU in China is a labor bureaucracy that it that could, will develop its own interests that may be separate to the party's interests. Now, I haven't seen any evidence of that, but this is a massive organization, a uh, very wealthy organization, you know, like the FNPR. In, in the way one of the Yeltsin got, Yeltsin got the FNPR in Russia to back it, so you keep your property, you keep the cash basically, we won't touch your property. And the ACFU likewise is, is property rich, is a very, you know, so uh, yeah, it, the, the, whether, whether the Chinese Communist Party will come to see the ACFU as a threat one day, I don't know. I think it's unlikely as things stand now. It's a sort of arm of the state. Yeah, it still remains an arm of the state. He has a question. Oh, yeah, um, we heard recently that um, America is worried by the, um, the Chinese government's um, uh, intent to develop the latest automated technologies in computing and so forth. Um, is automation and development of advanced technology actually making a big impact in Chinese industry? And is it having an effect of actually reducing uh, or replacing labour? Out of my comfort zone, so I, or research, so I can, can really only, I, I can't respond to this from the research, but I can give some examples. So um, I think there is a lot of investment, again, I can't give the figures, in automation. I think there's a lot of talk around, uh, but I think it's kind of, it's clustered around, um, 
it, it, it's not being rolled out on a kind of industrial level, right? Yeah. So I think that they're very interested in the technology. They're very interested in, in, in the idea of, of, of being innovative and they want to move away from this export promotion model and, or, and automation as part of that. But let's take the example of Foxconn. Foxconn is this massive Taiwanese electronics company that produces all the Apple stuff and the computers and all that stuff. He has, I think I'm right, 30 million employees in China, I think. 13 million? I think, or maybe it's 11 million. It's Taiwanese owned? Taiwanese owned, yeah. Uh, um, uh, Foxconn, he, I, I could have got the figures wrong there, but, but anyway, I, I mean, one thing at its height in Shenzhen, it employed almost 400,000 people in one site, and its own bus service, and its own fire service, and its cinema, schools, basketball courts, everything. Also, huge fast, strikes they had. Huge strikes, they high rates, uh, two, 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 you know, Foxconn, on the one hand you saw the tragedy of workers jumping off their buildings, uh, off their dormitories, um, basically because of the management, the isolating management methods that Foxconn were employing in these places. Um, uh, and then you saw also riots and strikes back in, in other Foxconn plants, so both sides of the labor movement, movement there. Foxconn has responded to this by saying it will automate. Terry Go, I think his name is the Taiwanese boss, said, right, we'll automate. You know, we, don't, we don't need these folks. We'll, but it hasn't happened. There's no sign of it happening in China. Um, it kind of makes me think that it reminds me of a little bit, of, you know, when, when you often get to us that, 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 you know, I know, it's, I know some capital is footloose and is able to move, and the new Chinese capital is moving, you know, just, uh, but, but for the big stuff to move, you know, it took quite a long time for that, all that uh, production to be related, say, relocated from states over to China or India or whatever. And, and, and although, um, there are threats around automation and uh, around that it makes me think, well, yeah, the threats are there, but the actual evidence isn't there yet, which isn't to say it won't emerge. It, it's, uh, and again, I go back to Florian's book, the, the book he, he specifically looks at this industrial transformation, and there's, I think there's a chapter on automation on that. Um, he, he found that it, that it existed, but it, again, it was clustered, and that uh, it certainly don't come up with any social upgrading at all. So I'm sorry I can't give you any more. I won't be speculating really. Any more questions on this side? Basically, it is a very, very difficult subject, especially to be a researcher, because there is multi-dimensional. Yeah. I mean, there is new technology developing. It makes impact. And there, is a, there was a three-party system in the Western countries, as well two-party system in Soviet mm -hmm. Union, mm -hmm. etc. And then now developing a new capitalist relations, yeah. uh, where to look at and how to see that the development yeah, yeah. is happening in which direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, yeah. For example, in Soviet Union, um, the, the, the trade unions were looking for housing. In, State yeah. housing. Yeah. Uh, this is big power yeah, yeah. in the hand of the uh, people who are administering. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, workers. Uh, if I were working in under under this condition, I would be afraid whether I will get the state uh, yeah. housing or not, yeah, and yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So I would agree, yeah. for me, most important things to see clearly how this three-party system. Comparing with the two party, which two party, I mean the Communist Party and the Italian relations, uh, and what they did that they, it leads to collapse. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I would like to see how capitalism is affecting top of that situation. Mm -hmm. um, that, I think that goes back to the slide I had around the, the myth of the double transition that the introduction of capitalist labor relations will somehow generate um, democratization or some form of, uh, some form of more pol po political democratization. The, 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 free, the, the, the introduction, of, introduction of markets therefore move us away from authoritarian governance and, and no, that's not been the case, it's a complete myth. Yeah. And again, I, I, the, the last chapter of the book um, again, I, I, it's a very challenging chapter, um, it's very strident, uh, 
but it's worth reading on that around you know about who, Frank Corset who is transforming who. I I think that yeah, there's there's no indication so far that the the, the introduction of capitalism, let's say in China, has produced uh, you know any 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 kind of positive uh, political reform. Really, in, in, you know, I don't necessarily buy the argument, and you, you often get it with people commenting or commentators or some researchers, particularly in the bourgeois press around Chinese investment, say in Africa or Bangladesh or somewhere. But let's take Africa, let's take Ethiopia, um, whereby you you say, oh, China is exporting its own authoritarian model of capitalism to Ethiopia. It's nonsense. Yeah. You know, capitalism doesn't have a flag like that. Yeah, of course, very different differences in that, uh, but 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 it's. That is not not a, a, a that is really a, a, a racialized view of uh, you know of, of Chinese capital that doesn't stand up to any serious analysis. Doesn't mean it doesn't have an impact. You know, I remember being at a conference with with, with a significant body of Ghana uh, trade unions were present, and I argued that ca Chinese capitalists in Ghana behave as they do because they're driven by profit and the extraction of surplus value. Not because they're Chinese, and this caused a huge fuss. <laughs> you know, oh yes, it's got that. You know, the, you know, very racialized discussion. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's not the case. And there's a really interesting. So, what book. was the argument there? I'm actually, I've just come back from Ghana. Oh right, okay. okay. Well, the, 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 you know, oh, you know, the, 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 oh, it's because the, you know they they are Chinese. They 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 are not like other. It was not, it wasn't was it really race bad. race racist kind of argument. It was racist. Yeah. yeah, it was racist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This yeah. was yeah. worse yeah. than the Ghana's trade unions. Yeah. 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 I mean, and they were saying that they're worse than other. Oh yeah, yeah. West, well, when actually the evidence, West, 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 the evidence West, suggests is, is, is yeah. the opposite is the case. So, yeah. I, I, a really interesting book just come out by yeah. Ching Quan Li yeah. on looking at Chinese capital in Zambia and Tanzania. Really yeah. worth a look at. And and indeed, I'm, I'm involved in. Um, I can send the names of these yeah, books. Yeah, I will definitely. Yeah. Re, re, and she argues that actually, the the fact that some of Chinese capital in Zambia is linked to the state. Not all of it, not like you know the, the bourgeois press would tell, oh it's all the state plan, it's all yeah. Xi plan. That's not true. There is a significant private investment. But she argued very powerfully that say if you look at Chinese state capital in in the Zambian copper mines, when when the crisis hit in two thousand nine and the price of copper prices that is, price of copper dropped, multinational capital from most countries, like a rat up a drain pipe, they were out of there, massive redundancies. The Chinese invested more. So she chink around these eyes, doesn't argue just because the Chinese Communist Party are nice people. Mm -hmm. She said that in it they have a much more long term view. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and also they, they can take a hit, you know. Their their financial hit, their ability to plan longer. Whether that will remain the case, I'm not sure. But there is a there is and she argues that actually that then opens up more potential agency for in this case Zambian actors, be they trade unions, be they political party leaders or government officials. So it's it's uh, it's a very interesting book. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah do do contact me and I'll send you that. Yeah. Any more questions? I will have uh, just one more word. Uh, you mentioned that you had some certain resources you could send us. Uh, if you could downloadable and the other information, then we can distribute. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It sure. would be fantastic. It, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll do that. We can communicate. Try maybe yeah. try and put a list. Can together. we use this uh, PPT also in our uh, website? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Let, I just I just want to check now. I've I acknowledged Rudy. Uh, here, my co-editor. You did at the beginning. I did at the beginning. Maybe I should should put him up there. You can send it later. Sure. Yeah, let me, then, yeah, yeah. Uh, we put it into PDF form. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, because I need to change that co-author yes. to co-editor, yeah. and, and I, I should. I, I want to highlight Rudy's role. Yes. So basically, I'm going to say all the mistakes of Rudy's and all the brilliant <laughs> answers. <laughs> of me. No, I'm Thank you very much. Thank you.